Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I am joined by my brother, the Gritty Brahmin. How are you, Brent? I'm well, thank you. All right, folks. Today's podcast is with Mark Kenyon. Uh, Mark Kenyon is, I think, 2013. He quit his job at Google and became a podcaster, podcast media like a content terrible. producer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because Mark and I kind of have a similar, I was like a couple years just behind him. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I was following Mark's path mm-hmm. and I saw him quit his job and do Wired to Hunt. And, and it's a, it's primarily a white tail focused podcast, mm-hmm. all things white tail, which is his passion and obsession and addiction. And I enjoyed following it along because I was able to take his tactics and apply them to black you know, tail. Yeah, hunting blacktail in my backyard, like very similar. And uh, he did his podcast, and I enjoyed it, and I followed along. And, I, and I'd always talked about doing a podcast and some film and stuff. And, and I was doing it, actually, a little bit on the side. And I actually wrote Mark an email. And I was like, <laughs> hey, dude, I'm actually thinking about fitting my posh desk job, you know, uh, and doing hunting podcast full time, you know. Mm-hmm. What do you – like I'd like some advice, and he was <laughs> Don't on. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, he was on a podcast where he actually was saying, he, and he said, "Hey, anybody who wants to reach out to me to talk about careers, and because he was on a podcast about getting involved in the hunting industry, and mm-hmm. so uh, I reached out, and it broke my heart because he didn't get back to me for like five months or six months. <laughs> but by, by the time Mark got back to me, I, I had already like Taking launched and d- done the jump and and everything." But then we got to sit down and talk and I learned a lot, even, you know, even though I'd already kind of dipped my feet in and it was pretty cool. And we've just been friends ever since. I'm a big fan of, of just how genuine and real Mark is. He does a, uh, he does this year. He did a series with meat eater Mm -hmm. called the back 40 and that's on YouTube. And I watched that this year. It's really cool. They buy a piece of property. Well, we talk about it on this podcast. So just listen to the podcast. It's primarily about public lands. So for those of you that hunt public land, especially for us out west, we're very familiar with it. Those out east, not so much. They're, they've, I think over the last, I don't know, four or five years, you know, awareness has skyrocketed on public lands. He talks about Ammon Bundy and their their takeover of the Malheur national forest and kind of his journey into learning about public lands. And then he, and anyway, he writes a book. I've read the book. It's awesome. And we talk about the book on the show today. It's a good conversation. You know, this year I was able to hunt. Well, I mean, public land, all my hunts were public land. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any hunts that weren't public land this year. And most of them were all over the counter hunts mm-hmm. as well uh, or one point or no point draw hunts and f- from bear to to elk to deer to himalayan tar even the tar yeah all the new zealand stuff was public land new zealand mm-hmm. is a public land treasure mm-hmm. like we have here in the united states they even have a thousand huts or something like that, that you can just stay in <laughs> that are like you'd have to pay like Big dollars to stay in something They're like that. They're either free, depending on how remote you <laughs> yeah, get, because like they don't want bucks, you to die. Fifteen bucks a night. I think that like the luxury <laughs> ones, like the one you take, like the Boy Scouts or the equivalent <laughs> they have down there out right. there, is like twenty five. So public land, it's a, it's a beautiful, brilliant concept. Mm. The world is only getting smaller as we get as as civilization and populations. China grow. and India, they're not going to save anything for public land. And when you set aside vast tracts of public land like they have in New Zealand and in the United States for people of all future generations, not only are you protecting the environment and, and procuring a future for animals like grizzly bear and wolves, but you're ensuring that there's a place for nature outside of civilization where human beings can still, you know, mm-hmm. go out and interact with it. And if you privatize all of it, history has shown it's going to go away. There are some incredible private land tracks out there where wilderness is wilderness. There's not much of it though, because at the end of the day, it usually becomes some kind of monetary. It's, mm-hmm. it's either drilled, <laughs> 
<laughs> chopped. I mean, history has shown. The land becomes raped and pillaged <laughs> real fast. <laughs> so anyway, today's podcast is with Mark Kenyon. You can follow him on Instagram, uh, Wired to Hunt. You can get to his stuff on Meat Eater. Go to Meat Eater. Check it out. And uh, check out the Back 40 if you're into uh, managing land for ecological benefit for, for wildlife. Uh, it's a pretty cool series and check out his book. His book is great. Get it on audible. If you're a listener, most podcast people like to listen to things. So mm-hmm. check it out. People there. who read nowadays. <sighs> like I got three Surprise magazines me. I want to, that I actually read, but the only time I read this it's is on the toilet, on the toilet. Yeah, exactly. Where magazines belong. Yeah. And, In the toilet. <laughs> And actually, one of them I'm only reading because Cameron Haynes uh, went off on an article he hated you know, in Field and Stream, which is another topic for another day. I have mixed feelings about Cam, but overall, he's a savage, and I love that about him. <laughs> I do, too. I do, too. So, folks, thanks for tuning in to the podcast. Before we get into the show, don't forget, you can save at Mountain, Mountain Ops. Ops. Use code Gritty. Use the code Gritty. Save at Sissy Sticks. Get yourself some carbon fiber slash aluminum trekking poles. Mm-hmm. Use code Gritty as well. Yep. And right now, if you use Gritty 15, you get a little discount. And by the way, those trekking poles, the, an equivalent design and build at REI is about twice as much money. They're over 200 bucks. Yeah. So you're getting a killer pole for the money. The value's solid there. And and then finally, you can save 15% at Heather's Choice. Uh, get yourself some backcountry meals, Backcountry snacks. Packaroons. Uh, Packaroons. Check that out. Use the code Gritty. All right. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and I'm joined today by my guest, Mark Kenyon from Wired to Hunt. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it, Brian. Uh, Mark and I, we go back. I mean, I I was listening to your podcast as you uh, quit your job at Google, you know, and started yeah. this podcast thing and there weren't a lot of podcasts uh hunting podcasts out at the time was it 2014 2013 yes started it in the spring of 2014 yep okay so uh i started listening to the wired to hunt podcast almost at the outset and you know i've primarily western hunts elk and mule deer and but i did a lot of backyard hunting for blacktail in my home state in oregon suburb of Portland. I was uh, in Oregon City. Yeah. And frankly, a lot of what you were covering applied really well to those backyard bucks in the suburban areas where where I would uh, chase blacktails. Yeah, I was always really intrigued by that, that you, that you found it relatable. Um, I've always, I, we never got to do it, but I was always interested in someday trying that out to see what it's like on the other side. Yeah, it's it's very similar. Having hunted both Whitetail and blacktail now. Uh, the I would say that uh, blacktail are a little more uh, like they're like a cross between mule deer behavior and whitetail behavior. Not as jumpy and skittish and switched on as uh, whitetail are, and a little more on that curious, calm side of a mule deer, hmm. but also extremely nocturnal. You know, even at a young age, you know, and and. Uh, very difficult to find and kill. Yeah. Make but you work for it. One thing about blacktail is they might like whitetail look up in a tree when they see you or when they, they figure out you're there, they're gone. They're just gone. Yeah. You know, and a lot of blacktail will give you that, that, that mule deer esque kind of, mm, what is that? Uh, and they don't bust away. Usually they just kind of, yeah, like, that's nice. Walk away. They're like, I like that. Can you send a few of them this way? <laughs> <laughs> I don't use that. Well, whitetail are like little crackheads. So, oh gosh, they are on edge. That's for sure. Um, so you wrote a book, and I read the book. And so today, on today's podcast, I wanted to talk about it. It's a yeah. book after my own heart. It's called That Wild Country, and it's it's basically about your public lands, uh, your your kind of public lands journey, understanding them what they're about. In fact, I'm going to read a little uh, excerpt right here at the front. It says, just to give people an idea of, of what this book entails, you write, every American is a public land owner, inheritor to the largest public land trust in the world. These vast expanses provide a home to wildlife population, populations, a vital source of clean air and water and a haven for recreation. 
Since its inception, however, America's public land system has been embroiled in controversy, caught in the push and pull between the desire to develop the valuable resources the land holds or to conserve them. Alarmed by rising tensions over the use of these lands, hunter, angler, and outdoor enthusiast Mark Kenyon set out to explore the spaces provided in, in this heated debate and learn firsthand how they came to be and what their future might hold. Part travelogue and part historical examination, that wild country invites readers on an intimate tour of the wondrous, wild, and public places that are a uniquely profound and endangered part of the American landscape. There that pretty it is. much sums it up. Yeah, yeah. That pretty good promotional copy right there. <laughs> <laughs> so did you write that or was that written by someone else? So that was written by my editor and then edited by me to make sure I was okay with it. Right. Um, but yeah, the publishing team kind of writes some of that promotional uh, material that's on the front of the book, the back of the book, um, on the Amazon page, all that yeah. kind of stuff. But it's a team, team process. Well, the thing is, as you read the book, it's kind of got this scaffold of your public lands, like travel log, like it, like the preface here says, and it gives you a, uh, a foundation to then lay out this historical and uh, current perspective on public lands that we've all kind of talked about and touched on. But he, in your book, you, you just really bring, put, give it to us in a real palatable format. Cause let's be honest, you start talking public lands and you start talking, laws and rules and all this kind of stuff and people get bored yeah there's a lot to digest <laughs> and you know what i found brian was that back in like 2014 and 15 and even 2016 when all this stuff about the land transfer movement started to really get some attention especially here within the hunting and fishing community um you know we were talking about it we were hearing about it from steve and randy and reading about in field and stream and outdoor life and at the same time, I was learning about all these things too, right? I'm from Michigan. Um, you know, over the last decade, I've spent a lot of time out west exploring public lands. But as a kid, as a young person, I kind of just knew there was this thing called public land, but I never really had any idea what that meant, how we got them. Uh, so when we got to 15 and 16, all this controversy is out there. I didn't really understand the context. I just found myself learning about this stuff. And being like, oh my gosh, this is horrible that someone would, somebody would want to get rid of these places. Um, but I didn't understand how we got to that point. So as I was trying to learn about all the current events, I constantly found myself wanting to look further back and try to understand, is there precedent for this? Has this ever happened before? What do you do about it? Uh, how do we move forward? And, and that kind of in a, in a cliff notes kind of way led me to realize I needed to dive in and start learning about this kind of stuff. Because if I didn't know what was going on and I was working in the outdoor media space and I've spent a lot of time out in these places, if I didn't know what was going on, I bet you the average guy or girl in the street in Michigan where I live or in New York City or in Florida um, probably knows a lot less. Right. And as I started kind of asking around and talking to people, uh, especially folks that don't live in the middle of the you know interior West where this stuff's part of daily life, um, there's this huge information gap. So, yeah, I thought maybe I can try to learn about this stuff, research it all, figure it out for myself and share that in, in an accessible way by sharing some of the stories of, of where I went and explored hands on while I was trying to figure out this whole deeper history lesson. So well, I'd like to read a couple, about. I'd like to read a couple pages here in the introduction and then ask you a few questions because the way you write it, it's just it's just well done. And, uh, you know, myself, I've kind of followed a similar journey as you have, you know, quitting my posh desk job and, uh, and then starting a podcast and, yeah. you know, being an outdoor voice and then, you know, being an advocate for public lands, all, all of these things. And I kind of learned the same way. I always went out and hit public lands, hunted them and played on them. And I just assumed they were there and would always be there. Yep. I didn't even know how they got there or, or I, it's just part of being, especially for me, born out West. There's just public land everywhere. We right. just camped constantly. There was no, it wasn't crowded either. And we hunted all over. And so it wasn't until right around the same period of time as I, as I was getting 2013, 14, 15, you know, more involved that I started to learn what well, it really wasn't until public lands were under a, another attack that I, 
that I was aware of any of this. Yeah. That's when I started reading all, all, all the same things you've covered in this book. But this yeah. book is a lot more, as you're looking at it here, it's a lot more digestible than my other book <laughs> that I read, which is by Douglas Brinkley. Yeah, great Rich, book. But Wilderness that's a doozy. Warrior. And I've, yep. <laughs> I've done like three podcasts on it, trying to break down the book. And But the problem is, is it's just so much that yeah. it's really difficult to deliver it and keep it interesting for yeah. people where you pretty much kind of did what I kind of wanted to do in this book. So <laughs> I was you, did trying. A, you did a great job. I was um, trying. Anyway, I'm going to read a little bit here and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Yeah. So, so you say, uh, you wrote 760 miles away in Southeastern Oregon, Ammon Bundy had led a convoy of vehicles through the silent snow covered wetlands of another stretch of American public lands the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Arriving at the refuge headquarters, the armed men had walked in illegally and illegally assumed control of the federal facility and, and protected landscape. His father, Cliven Bundy, had gained nationwide attention for his own armed standoff with the feds in 2014, after he refused to pay the public land grazing fees. And it appeared that Ammon was carrying on where his father left off claiming that his militia was occupying the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in the name of two local ranchers who Ammon believed had been unjustly incarcerated by the federal government for setting fires on public land. Their demands quickly expanded to include much more. Now, I remember this. I mean, I'm from Oregon. Uh, this was happening in my backyard. And it was a heated topic, especially on Facebook and Instagram and the social sphere where you had people on their their side and a lot of anti-government folks kind of siding with Bundys and they were talking a good talk too. Like me being a small government kind of Republican type conservative, like they were kind of speaking some of the same language that, that I sure. agree with, right? So you, you're you're on this drive with your wife, Kylie, during this time and you're you're heading to what was it, Yellowstone? So that in the beginning was in Utah, oh, that's down right. there around Moab when this whole thing was going on. Um, so, so yeah, we we I think the Bundy standoff that whole thing started January, early January, and then yeah. I think Kylie and I were in Utah about I don't know ten to fourteen days into the standoff, give it somewhere in that ballpark, right. if I remember right. So, and so, so it was all happening at the same time. So you say, uh, when I watched Ammon on YouTube, clad in a blue-gray flannel jacket, in one of his many press conferences explaining that the group planned to occupy Malheur until they could unwind the claim, quote, unwind the claims the federal government has on this land. And then uh, he then spelled out his belief that the federal government's possession and management of public lands was unconstitutional. The federal government, in his view, had exceeded its powers in its protection and management of public lands, and because of that, the land should be transferred or sold to states, counties, or private citizens. Ammon, in so many words, was asserting that ownership of federal public lands, iconic places like those surrounding the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Mount Rainier, Yosemite, and the Smokies, should be transferred from the federal government and by extension from American citizens to the highest bidder. Unfortunately, his brash and illogical reasoning didn't come uh, didn't come as a shock. I was familiar with his ideology, now commonly referred to as the land transfer movement, from the outdoor media outlets I consumed even even before the Bundys brought it to the national stage. I took umbrage with these threats, but mostly dismissed them as far fetched, transferring or selling our public lands, the places that millions of Americans across the uh, country flock to every year. It seemed impossible. A radical fantasy that would be relegated to the fringe. But as an avid hiker, angler, backpacker, you paid attention, conservationist. And so then you're watching this, and th I love this right here. Unbeknownst to many, and this is the key point, I think, that kind of uh, sets a foundation here for why your opinion is really against Bundy. Unbeknownst to many... American citizens are collective co-owners of an incredible swath of land across the country, approximately 640 million acres of it. That's roughly 28% of the total United States landmass, an area larger than Alaska, Texas, and New York combined. And this public land from Montana to Manhattan and beyond is available for all to use to observe wildlife, camp, hunt, 
hike, fish, or bike on. But there, Bundy was in mighty in in. Uh, but there, Bundy was in nightly news feed, proposing that these places should be given away or sold off to private owners. I, I think that for a lot of people hearing this, it did not occur, especially for those that are that maybe were further east, where the west, where the most of that public land is in the western United States. The fact that it's owned collectively by all U.S. citizens is kind of um, is it's just a forgotten fact. So so true. And again, I think like you were saying earlier, we, it's so easy to take for granted. If if you do know about these places, it's easy to take them for granted. But almost worse are folks that don't even realize we have this inheritance. The whole Bundy thing did, for a lot of people at least, is it brought to the attention of the average American out there that there was controversy around it because a lot of people didn't pay attention to this whole land transfer movement until it started showing up on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and wherever else, because there was a bunch of guys with guns taking over a federal facility saying, Hey, the federal government shouldn't have these lands. They shouldn't be managing them, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes, sometimes it takes a dramatic event like that for people to, open their eyes to it. And what I found concerning, though, was attention was being drawn to public lands, but in a very negative way. And like you said, in a certain sense, some people were hearing this and saying, hey, they're kind of speaking my language. I want to see smaller government. I want to see. But but the way the Bundys uh, phrase it is that this is land stolen from the people and hoarded by the government. And therefore, we don't get to have it and we want the land back. And later, so they say. That's and it sounds like you you immediately hear that soundbite and you're like, yeah, I want the land right. back. The federal right. government, sh- yeah, you know, it, it's this feeling like uh, it's it's basically saying, hey, people, the government is is taking advantage of U.S. citizens by hoarding all this property for itself, and uh, and 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 stealing it from you. That's the that's that's what they're saying. That's that angle, yeah. But it's not true. And you wrote in there. I, uh, let me see if you somewhere in here you may you have a, a a comment where you basically say that doesn't make sense because we already own the public lands. Exactly. And we so, are we are all owners of these places. Right. So if you really dissect his argument, it's like, wait a minute. We already own it. It's already ours. It's already collectively owned by all Americans for multi-use. And that use uh, is clearly defined. It's already ours. So what what Bundy's saying is, okay, well, so what is he really saying then, Mark? If he's saying, we want the land back, who who gets the land back? Right. If you look at the folks that are typically making that argument, Usually they want just a very specific group of people to have that land to use. Usually it's for exploitive reasons. They want to kind of reap every dollar and cent they can off of this land, whether it be selling it or drilling it for oil, for oil or cutting down timber or whatever it might be. And those things are all good and well, and they're part of what public lands can and should be used for. But why the public land system we have today is particularly – effective for all of us co-owners is that no one group gets the whole say. If we were to give this land to counties or give this land to states or sell it off to the highest bidder, as some of these folks would have us do, all of a sudden these landscapes become dominant use focus. So if someone wants to run cattle on it, that's all that's going on. If someone wants to make a make a dime from it, then you get what we had in the late 1800s and the early 1900s where these forests are being leveled to the ground with no plan for the future. So what we have instead is a federal public land system where many different stakeholders are at the table and where the long term is kept in mind. So we have forests still that are Mm -hmm. sustainably being logged but also used by hunters, also being used by campers, also being grazed. by folks running livestock. We're able to do all those things because we share it and we have a common management system in place to allow those things to keep happening. So the federal government is not perfect. I'm not saying that our public land system is perfect, but we have a unique system here in place in America. We have a vast space of wild country still that most countries do not have. And we're able to 
keep it pretty darn intact, pretty darn healthy, and quite usable for a lot of people, that's a hell of a privilege. Well, and you break it down, too, because um, the dirty secret is that when the, when they're talking about this, they say something like, hey, we need to take this from, from our evil federal government that's just hoarding these lands, and we need to give it back to the control of the people, and especially the local people in each local state. Again, having the sort of a conservative, um, you know, small government kind of approach to, yeah. to how I see government's role in our lives, it's like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But then sure. when you start breaking it down, you get into – and you start looking at especially the history. Has this been done before? And you actually bring that you, – you cover that in the book. And it's it's happened a few times. One of the most – notable recent memory was the sagebrush rebellion yeah where it's this notion of hey let's take all these lands that are co-owned by all americans so if you're in new york you own this land that's in this federal land that's in colorado utah nevada wyoming you you own all that too it's not just the people that live in wyoming that own that land it's all americans it's federally owned public land so the idea of taking Everyone's inheritance that lives outside of that state of let's just pick one like Montana and saying, okay, now we're going to take what's owned by all you as citizens. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to make it owned by Montana. Well, first of all, that would piss me off because I used, <laughs> okay, this year I hunted Idaho. I hunted, you know, out, I hunted in Colorado. I've hunted Arizona. I've hunted Oregon, Washington, like we, we've kind of hit all these states every, all the time. And there's public land on all of it that I have a right to and access to. And if you were to take that and make it only owned by the local state people, that just seems like it's just completely unfair. It would, it would be, instead of it being an, a national resource, it would be a regional. Yeah. And I mean, history has shown that a whole lot of other things change when the states control that land too, which was like why that, that goes back to what you were saying earlier about what the designations are for how they're managed as federal lands versus once they're given to the state, the track record is, is, is abysmal. Yes. Most states have very different mandates for how that public land should be managed and for what, you know, what they're managing for. So a lot of states are much more obligated to manage those lands for profit. While with federal public lands, again, multiple use is managed for sustainable development, but also clean air and water. Also, um, you know, making sure there's sustainable recreation going on, making sure it's managed for wildlife habitat. All these different things mm -hmm. have to be thought about. But when you get some of these state lands, they don't necessarily have what some might call hoops to jump through, right. but uh, they're important hoops to jump through to keep these places around. So because of that, what has happened in a lot of states is that state land gets overran by development and or sold. You look at states like Utah or Nevada. I, I think I know, you know, the story, all the Western states, when they became yep. part of the United States, they ceded control of any lands within, um, within their borders to the federal government as part of that statehood. And they're given though a certain set of, Hey, here's a certain set of land that's going to remain state land under your control. And you can use this to support your public school system and various other programs. Right. Now you look at a lot of these States like Nevada and Utah in particular, they've sold off Nevada is the worst. I think I wish I could remember this number, something like 97% 90, of the land yeah. they had something crazy it's gone, gone, it's gone. Um, and many other States have been some other pattern of use like that. Right. Um, you you get all sorts well, of other it's changes always, too. The state lands are always up for sale. Yes. If the right price tag comes along, and state budgets are seem to always be in deficit, and yep. and the local politician, whoever's there at that time, it's like, well, it, the whole maybe five ten years that this the, these politicians are in office they can look real good if they just sell off the land and then have all this right. budget and they can spend money unfettered, uh, yep. but it's not saving it for future generations. Yeah. And that's one of the key word phrases that you use throughout the book is you're describing federal public land system. The way Theodore Roosevelt envisioned it is yeah. that these lands are to be managed, not just for us now, 
but for so that they can be enjoyed by all future generations. Yeah. And that was, you know, throughout this whole process, as I was trying to understand all the different stakeholders right at play here. And, and, and it kept coming back to the fact that there's a way that I use these lands, right? I like to hunt, I like to fish, I like to camp and backpack and all this kind of stuff. So I have a bias and that I love to use these places in that certain way. I understand though, that that comes from just my perspective. I also realized that these are our lands as Americans. So everyone has a right to use them in their own way. So I've tried, to, I tried to approach this issue and I tried to approach this book and, and how I was learning about everything with, with an open mind to other people's perspectives and how they use them too. So I have just as much a right as someone who is out there with an ORV or ATV using the land as much as someone who wanted to run cattle on it. We all had a right to this land. And we all had a say at the table. We should have all a say at the table as far as how it should be managed in the future. So the one thing that I was always reminded, though, of when we're trying to decide how these things should be managed or what regulations should be put in place or how we should share them is always using the filter of what Theodore Roosevelt said, exactly like you mentioned, always thinking about the future generations, those yet to come. That was what Roosevelt always focused on as is where we need to keep our eye pointed towards. Right. So if we're sitting and we're debating, should you do this or this, that or this, I always err towards, well, what's going to be best for the next generation? And I think that is a North Star will always help us when it comes to these public land debates because there's going to be debates. Yeah. There right. always will be. There always has been. The most frustrating thing about public land is that there's all these people at the table and so you're constantly pulling at the rope like a game of tug of war. But that's also one of the best things about it is that we all get a say. Well, when when you were talking about and Ammon Bundy about that entire debacle, it brought to my mind like I, I can't help but get really angry uh, over people like Bundy because at the end of the day, what is really coming out of his mouth, in my opinion, is – I should get to have these lands or the people I think should have them should have them. Yeah. And so instead of it being a, a public space that we all get to use and, and these guys didn't have their land robbed from them. They sold it period. This isn't like they didn't get compensated. You can't get, if someone goes and buys my house, I can't go 10 years later and say they stole it from me. They made me sell it, it or it wasn't fair. It's worth so much more now. It's like you yeah. sold it. It was a fair transaction. You agreed. They agreed. Done. You don't get to go back and whine later and say, I want it back. It's extremely selfish to me for to have that viewpoint as well because at the end of the day, it's like who decides then who gets to have the property? Because when you say put it back in the state control, put it back here, sell it to people, make it privatized. You're essentially giving the land over to those with the most money. And yeah. often that be becomes corporate interests or wealthy individuals. And you end up with a, a, a country with no public land left, like you find in England, for example. Yeah. What a travesty that would be. Because one of the greatest resources, especially for growing, out, growing up out west, just it's the, our public land system is the envy of the world. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that, that I hoped to some small degree this book could help with as well is just make these places a little bit more accessible to the average person too. So yeah. be, because right, our audience, my audience, your audience, folks that listen to this podcast, we're out there getting after it already. Um, we're lucky in that we know about these places. People talk about it. Folks within the outdoor world did a great job sharing the story and the opportunities available out there. But there's a lot of people that just don't realize that we're the envy of the world and don't realize what a blessing having this stuff is. And so they almost need to be reminded often, hey, this is a place. It's not just a Netflix documentary that you watch about Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. This is actually a real live place that you can go to and you can have a real physical visceral experience. It's a whole hell of a lot better than playing on Facebook on your phone all day. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I hope through some of these stories that I could share of just a bumbling idiot like me going out there and experiencing these things that anyone can go out there and enjoy these places. And it is something that changes you. I don't think you can go out and 
hike through the sawtooth or raft down a river in the Bob Marshall or just even drive through Yellowstone, even just something as simple and touristy as that, you can't help but be in these places and not feel a profound effect. It just changes you. There's something I've often thought about just from um, an ecological perspective, the future of you know the natural world. We human beings are animals too, and we really need clean water, clean air, clean clean things. We need nature to stay preserved. And there are there are animals that that win the lottery when civilization comes creeping in. Mm. White tails, they just yeah, uh, they're just unreal. I think I just read the other day. There's what is there thirty million white tails. It sounds about right. Yeah. 30 million whitetails. There's, there's like two or 3 million mule deer. Wow. Whitetails just, they just thrive when, when human beings roll in and establish subdivisions. Yep. And the same is true for coyotes. The mm-hmm. same is true for rodents. Rats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and the list yeah. goes on. There are animals that lose though. Yes. Like grizzly bear. Mm-hmm. They can't, they can't be rolling up into a subdivision. No. There's, there's no way they need vast spaces of contiguous wilderness of, of contiguous uncivilized untouched land in order to live wolves, same thing. They just, they can't be on the edges of the city limits. They can't coexist with humans. And then like mule deer, for some reason, they just kind of decline yeah. as civilization moves in their migration routes get knocked off and, they they just kind of slowly diminish, and and that's just kind of your megafauna. There's all sorts of small animals and birds and insects and and such that just that die when civilization encroaches. And so when you look at the math, like you, you gave it, you know, earlier, some twenty eight percent of the United States is federal public land. 75, 75% basically is already set aside as used, however it ends up being used. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I read a, a study recently that said that about 2 million acres of open space is developed every year in America. So we're losing a big chunk of open space every single year. That, Like you said, there's a lot of animals and people that are losers because of that. And when I look at when I look at it from that lens, I think to myself, we, we can't afford to give up that last 25%. We can't afford to, to, to transfer that to States and then have it slowly be privatized and sold off and, or logged and mined in a way that we, we need at least, I mean, can we not spare 25% for nature? Yeah. We, we've already and- taken 75 we as yeah. a as a race as a country as as human beings we already have claimed 75% of it it just yeah. seems like when when i hear people say see people say i can't afford a piece of property you know the federal government has our public lands all tied up they should release that to the public uh so i can afford something i'm i'm thinking there's already 75% of it out there yeah we've laid claim to can can we not leave twenty five percent for the grizzly bear mm-hmm. and the wolf? Those animals that can't survive if we sell it off. People have a, an idea when they see like a. I think they see a stretch of wilderness and they go, "Oh, that's plenty of room for for the grizzlies there." Yeah, we don't need. To, and when you look at the math, it's like, what is there three? What's the population of the United States right now? Oh gosh, three hundred and seventy million or something like that. Yeah, so three, that sound right? The three hundred twenty fifty million, something like Somewhere that. Somewhere in that. You know how many bears, black bears, are in the nor- in North America? Somewhere A decent around number. Four hundred thousand, I think, or five hundred thousand. Okay. okay. Three hundred million human yeah. beings compared to four hundred thousand black bears. Yeah. Half a million black bears. It's like, why is that balance okay with people? Right. Yeah, we have a hard time sharing. That's probably a little bit of human nature right there and and, and a little bit of American nature, I guess. Um, it's hard to look beyond just what your own self-interest is. 
whether that's person to person or person to other species. But man, that is something that our forethought forefathers, thank goodness, realized would be a challenge for decades and decades and decades. So they found a way to insist that we put aside a little bit of land to share. Well, um, when you look, now we're benefiting from it. Well, and you you cover all all of this really in detail as you describe your travel to all these different parks and these different public lands, and you're you're detailing your experience with your first buffalo and you know wolves howling and and fishing in these places, right? And soaking up these public lands, but in the midst of that, you're taking us back to how they got there. Yeah. And w- what the the philosophy is behind it and how it's under threat today. And it's a really, it's a solid, well done book. And I, I actually highly recommend that people listen to it on audio. Because if yeah. you're a podcast listener, you're a listener. You're not necessarily yeah. a, a page reading, you know, book reader. I used to. But nowadays, man, it's all audiobook for me. Yeah. I know and, a lot of people saying the same thing. And uh you you got the audiobook version and so uh I've I've soaked that up. It's a very easy listen. Later in the book, uh, you you write about being at the the Backcountry Hunters and Angler Rendezvous in 2018. Yeah. You know, a lot's happened since then. You had Chaffetz in in the HR6 Six twenty one, uh, where he got all that backlash for for people that yeah. don't know, there was basically a land transfer law trying to be put put in place, and hunters got like rallied together and shut it down. And I like Chaffetz, actually. I actually yeah. like the guy. If you talk to him about other issues, I'm like, I, I want him on my side. Yeah, but the Republican Party itself, and and the way they've handled public lands. I like Senator uh, Mike. Um, Mike Lee. Mike Lee. He has said things about public lands that just burn my soul, that just yeah. infuriate me. Yeah. And yet I I appreciate what he does in terms of fighting for you know policy and other 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 things I value in terms of sure. free speech and the Second Amendment and all these things that I, I as a Republican type cons- conservation type minded person yeah but but yet i feel like sometimes the republican party isn't my party at all and and the democratic one is doing a lot is is more in line with a lot of how i feel about my public lands yeah it's a weird thing and it's it's such a frustrating aspect to this whole issue is that there's no political party in my mind at least that really represents our interests terribly well on this issue because like you said, uh, on, on one side of the aisle, there's, there's a certain group of Republicans who are very anti-public lands, who are proposing a lot of these ideas that I personally, and it sounds like you too, think are a very bad idea. At the same time, many of those same people are supporting our rights to hunt, our rights to bear arms, and, and many other issues that are great. Freedom of speech. On the other side. Which seems yes. like it's very much under threat nowadays with censorship. Yeah, I can't man. put things on YouTube without it getting blocked all the time. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So there's... There's a lot of crazy stuff. On the on the other side, you've got the Democratic Party, which has got all sorts of ideas that I don't agree with. But at the same time, they're pretty darn good about the environment. They're pretty darn good about public lands. So I find myself, and I hear from a lot of people that feel the same way, I'm kind of stuck in the middle. I wish I could create some superhuman new political party that had the best of both worlds, but you can't. So all you can do is talk to your representatives, talk to the people you voted for, whether it was a Republican or a Democrat. If it's a Republican, if you represent, if you feel that, um, or if you've got someone in office, let them know, hey, I appreciate what you're doing on this issue and this issue. I voted for you because of this issue and this issue, but I really disagree with you on this other thing. And if you don't get your act together on that one, I'm going to have to say something about it. And other people are too. And I think that there's a little bit of this feeling um, like I get this when it comes to Michigan State sports. I love the Michigan State Spartans. I'm a huge basketball and football fan. I'm a huge homer. So because of that, when they make mistakes, when they do something stupid, when they make a decision that I don't agree with, I find myself giving them a free pass or trying to close my eyes to it because I just love Michigan State so much. I'm just going to say, well, you know, whatever. Right. We'll, we'll win the game. 
But that's the same thing like voting, being a Republican, voting for a Republican. You feel like, well, they're doing this stupid shit on public lands and it doesn't make me happy. But I'm not supposed to criticize my home team or I don't want to criticize my home team because that's what all the University of Michigan people are doing. I don't want to be like a University of Michigan person. <laughs> right. Well, that's the same kind of thing going on here. I, I think that we should all feel very open and comfortable criticizing even the teams, even the people we generally support if they've got it wrong sometimes. Because right. we have, as a voter for that party or that representative or senator or whatever it is, you've got a special asset in place. Because they're going to listen to you more than anybody else because they're depending on you to keep them in office. Um, so if you, the Republican voter, says, hey, you know what? You got it wrong on this one, buddy. If you want me to keep supporting you, you got to change your tune. They're going to listen a whole lot more than, let's say, a Democrat who wasn't going to vote for them anyways. And the same thing flipped the opposite way. If you consider yourself a Democrat and you're voting for Democrats, um, same thing. Tell them, stop being stupid about hunting rights. Stop being crazy right. about this thing or that thing. I wish that this didn't have to be such a political partisan issue. I wish we could just be Americans and appreciative of our public lands and the wild places we have left and stand together for them. And so something I tried to do with this book is I tried to address what is, yes, it is a political issue. Like right, Many of these issues are coming from one side of the political aisle. But I really wanted to convey the necessity of us setting aside our partisan labels, taking the R off your shirt or the D off your shirt yep. and just putting the American public land owner shirt on just like you've got right now and say, hey, you know what? You're different than me. I maybe don't agree with you on a lot of things, but we do both love public land. Let's work together for it. We do both have this shared inheritance. Which, which you know, I'm going to read this a little bit here. So 2018, you're at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous and you say, it was a unique crowd. In some ways, it was homogenous. The uniform of choice seemed to be some combination of flannel, camo, Patagonia puffies, trucker hats, and t-shirts that said public land owner. But the crowd was also much younger and more diverse than you might expect. The average age fell somewhere in the 20s or 30s, and there was a high number of women. The crowd was filled with people who loved to hike and hunt and fish and camp and bike and climb and boat. And they loved the public lands that allowed them to do that. Most notably, there was a man there who was not typically associated with the hunting world. He stood on, on stage the next night in a flannel and blue jeans. This is the most amazing organization I have ever seen, he said to a standing ovation. It was Yvon Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia and the man who arguably had become the most outspoken and influential voice in the public lands fight from within the outdoor recreation community. The relationship between the Cabela's crowd and the REI crowd had been, at times, at least to some people, a tense one. Hunters and anglers have traditionally leaned more conservative, while the, the hiking, biking, and climbing crew skewed more liberal. There were lightning rod issues on both sides that divided the collective even further. Hunters and anglers were regularly frustrated by anti-gun proposals coming from the left, while some within the REI crowd were fundamentally opposed to the idea of ever hunting animals. Patagonia, in particular, seemed an unlikely bedfellow. In the past, the company had come out strongly against certain hunting-related issues, such as the reintroduction of a carefully managed grizzly bear hunt after grizzlies had been removed from the endangered species list. But none of this contentio contentious history mattered to Yvonne, or to the attendees at the rendezvous. It was time to set aside our differences and join forces for the greater good. As Chenard toured the outdoor plaza where the beers, bands, and public lands bash was taking place, he was repeatedly stopped and thanked by folks passing by. I walked up to Chenard when I spotted an opening and introduced myself sticking out my hand. He was smaller than I'd expected for someone of such huge stature in the outdoor world. His hair was thin and gray and his skin had aged with time, but his eyes were youthful and sparkling. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for making this statement. It was a monumental win to have such a prominent figure from the recreation community attending a hunting and angling rally. Patagonia, one of the loudest voices in the public land battle of one of the uh, and one of the more liberal-leaning companies in our outdoor world, was willing to stand side-by-side side with hunters and anglers, some of the most conservative stakeholders in that same space. If the founder of Patagonia was willing to take this stand for public lands, despite some large differences in opinions on other matters, why couldn't the rest of us? They say that hunters 
this is a quote by Chenard. They say that hunters and tree huggers can't get together. That's bullshit. The only way we're going to get anything done is to work together. You know, I, I hear a lot of times in our community people who just really despise Patagonia because sure. of their an, sort of anti-hunting stance on things often. And I get a lot of people writing in that are that are like, I'm, I'm not working with BHA anymore because they work together with Patagonia. I, it's such a difficult thing to do to put aside those differences that we have because I fundamentally disagree with an anti-hunting world. Uh, yep. I, I fundamentally disagree with the idea of, of, of getting rid of the North American model of conservation, of just letting you know animal populations go unchecked and... We don't live in a place where we have that luxury anymore. And I feel like it's such a waste of resources. You know, I think uh, the stat that I heard five years ago or read about was there's 300 million pounds of whitetail deer meat consumed every year annually. You know, and you have Shane Mahoney right now doing the, the Wild Harvest Initiative and getting hard numbers on that. Yeah. But you look at 300 million pounds of organic meat protein that that is consumed by americans each year and you want to get rid of that what do you replace it with you ha what is it the alternative and how how right. what impact does that have how does it affect us economically how does it nutritionally and and all these things so i i vehemently disagree with an anti-hunting stance at the same time these people value our public lands just like i do and they want to keep them in public hands just like i do and they have tons of money and a huge voice. And it's and so it's like, man, agreeing that there can be a, a coalition standing together to protect public lands, but 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 also agreeing that we're going to disagree on some other things is a hard, hard sure. step to take, Mark. I mean, it is, of course. Um, and there's always going to be some segment of a population that is not ever going to be willing to consider different points of view, right? There's, there's a small loud minority of folks that are very anti hunting. And then there's a very, there's a small segment of folks that are, I'm not sure what other example it'd be, but there's, yeah. there's these loud minorities, but then there's this big middle ground of people. So for example, within a company, within the outdoor recreation community, let's say the REI crowd, there's a bunch of folks who are probably kind of there in the middle. They're like, Hey, I'm okay with hunting and stuff. I maybe don't like this picture I saw on CNN of a lion getting shot, or maybe I don't like the idea of killing grizzly bears, probably because they don't really understand it. And I think that's what you have to look at is, do I want to close my eyes or shut the door on all those people just because they don't believe everything I do in exactly the same way? Um, or do I say, all right, hey, Patagonia and REI and all these folks within that community. Yeah, there's there's a couple thousand of you that I think are real turds in the bucket. I think you guys don't have it figured out at all. I think you're missing the boat on all these things. But then there's this whole other slice of people that are persuadable or indifferent or curious who maybe look different than us or vote differently than we do or approach things with a different viewpoint that still, though, just love these wild places. Mm -hmm. And if we just started chatting with these people, we'd find that 7 out of 10 of them or 8 out of 10 of them are just like us in a lot of ways. And those are the people that I think we can try to have conversations with and try to work with and try to stand together with. So I thought that what Shannard did, while I certainly disagree with him on plenty of things, it was demonstrative. It was representative of something that we as a community need to think of more about, which is – how do we work with that seven to eight out of 10 people who are reasonable, different, but reasonable? Um, if we just stay in our little bubble, we're not going to get anything done. Well, that's the reality, right? Like if you don't work together on the, if you just say, nope, they're out, they're out. Then how do you ever build on common ground? How do you exactly. ever, you know, change someone's mind? There has to be some mutual respect for each other and as you both fight for this common space and this thing you believe in in the in the form of public lands you it comes out of that a mutual respect for each other and then it becomes more of a discussion about well i don't necessarily agree with hunting 
but mm-hmm. I do respect you as a person and I, and, and I respect that you have a right to use the land as you wish. Yeah. And I suppose it's better than going to the grocery store, you know, yeah. I guess. And so you start to have these conversations, you start to make inroads, but yeah, when you just, point. when you just close the door, I agree with you that you, you really can't change anyone's mind when your reaction is, you don't agree with me. You're out. Yeah. Uh, you're done. You're dead to me. We can't get anywhere in this world like that. And it seems no. like that's, that is the norm in public discourse today. Your Twitter, yes. Twitterati mobs out there. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like either you agree or you're deplorable or <laughs> yes. you agree or, or you're an idiot. And, yes. And uh, we, we really need to, I think social media has played a, a huge role in this. It's got its pros and its cons, but it's, it tends to remove, it tends to make us feel like we're not talking to a human, but we're mm-hmm. talking to an idea or a character or a character. And no. we wouldn't say these things that we say the way we say them. If we actually met the person, it's yeah. funny. I've, vilified a few like chaffetz and then you talk sure. to the person you're like oh no, he's they're, human. they're people he's got yeah, kids humans. he's got a wife yeah. he's actually <laughs> he's actually yeah. not a horrible human being you know and you start to figure these things out it's like yeah social media has inserted this sort of false wall that that we're so we're not deciphering and communicating with respect like we like we could in the past and it's yeah but i, I feel like that's also shifting as we're coming to grasp with technology and yeah, I hope so in our life. I don't know. I hope so. I think you bring up a great point and another story from history, I think can help guide us a little bit in that we had this exact conundrum a hundred some years ago where there were different groups of folks who wanted to protect public lands in some way, form, or fashion, but they disagreed vehemently on certain aspects of it. Take, for example, Theodore Roosevelt, super badass Republican, big game hunter, right? Right. As far as you go to that side of things. And then you got John Muir, who very liberal, totally. very preservationist, environmentalist, founded the Sierra Club. Theodore Roosevelt founded the Boone and Crockett Club. You couldn't imagine two... <laughs> different more different groups maybe but these people these two guys both love these places they love wildlife and open space and they said you know what john i know you're an anti-hunter i'm a big game hunter and john muir said hey teddy i know you like to shoot animals i would rather protect them let's go camp together let's talk about it let's share our viewpoints let's talk about this incredible place here in yosemite that we both love How can we try to keep this around? We both want to do that. How can we keep generally sustainable and healthy wildlife populations around? We both want that. We might not agree on the details, but sitting down and breaking bread and sharing a campfire, being humans, I think that is the antidote. That's the blueprint for how we do this. And and Teddy and John showed us how to do that 110 years ago. Yeah, it's that simple too. Uh, We've been... I've been taking people hunting for the first time the last few years, um, just a different person each year. They, they come from usually a very more liberal background and, and, and city inner city type thing. And they, they're mm-hmm. not, they're just not the whole concept of hunting is foreign. You bring them out there yep. and wow, it changes their whole perspective. Yeah. There's, there's, I think if we, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. I think there's more opportunity than we realize as far as making those bridges and those yeah. connections to people different than us. Yeah, there's there's that minority who's just – they're not going to open their eyes or be interested in it. But you know, back in my previous life, I used to work, as you know, back at Google, mm-hmm. and I was living in San Francisco with a lot of really liberal, you know, coastal Ivy League kids – who had no experience or, you know, we had nothing in common when it came to all these other things. But for the most part, when they found out I hunted and when they found out the stuff that I like to do, they were mostly just curious. Yeah. They were like, Hey, I've seen, Same. I've, I've seen this thing on TV or I, I saw this article or I saw this picture on social media. Is that what, was that what this is really all about? Yeah. I, I, this is how I feel about it when I see that. And then they would, but ask me, they want the real deal. They want to understand where I came from, why this was such a cool thing, why it was something that I was so passionate about. And if you can just get to the point where you're able to have those conversations, it's amazing what can happen from there. A lot of people genuinely interested, intrigued, wanting to get out and see these places, do these things. Yeah. Um, 
And, and that's kind of the approach I took to this book too, was trying to, trying to write a book that was an open door. That was the beginning of a conversation that was putting a hand out there and say, Hey man, come along. Let's chat. Well, on that note, you, you have uh, chapter 15 of your books that is titled hope. And sometimes I feel like we get a little discouraged in this public lands discussion. It's like two steps forward, one back or two back, yeah. one forward at times. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like though it's like with everything in life, if you don't believe in a future, if you don't have hope, then you won't take any action. You, you got to believe. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the truth for so many <laughs> things in life. Um, and, and speaking of Chenard, uh, one thing I do agree with when it comes to Chenard is this line he likes to, to trot out often, which I think is great, which is the only cure for depression is action. So whenever I start feeling bad about things, the news about public lands or the environment or hunting rights, whatever it is, mm-hmm. you can sit and you can mope about it or throw your hands up in the air and say, oh, my gosh, this world's going. You could do that. Or you could say, this is what's happening. What can I do about it? And that's, I think, a much more effective way to go about it. Absolutely. Well, I encourage people, Mark Kenyon's book, That Wild Country, uh, get it on Audible. If you want to listen to it or Amazon, can you get the audio version off Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they own audible, so it's all there. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, pick it up wherever you want to get it. It's out we'll, there. We'll put a link in the, in the YouTube notes for people that, that go there. Now, if you have a buddy or friends that aren't necessarily into hunting, but love their public lands, your REI crowd friends, not your Cabela's crowd, your yeah. REI crowd friends. I think this is an excellent book to kind of bring them along in, in yeah. uh, to introduce them to kind of the hunting ethic and how, why we value public lands, g- given your perspective and what you do for a living and, and your, you know, where you come from, Mark. I think it's a great book to have on Audible for uh, your your friends that are too lazy to learn about politics or that are or or they're more anti hunting you just turn it on in the car on a long road trip and you listen to mark <laughs> read his book and it's great conversation piece as well because there's so many things that that come in there i find myself wanting to turn turn it off after chapter 1 and and then d- debate it with someone then <laughs> listen to chapter 2 and then <laughs> To talk about it with someone, you know, it's a good way to do it. It's definitely got that kind of, um, you know, feel to it where everyone's going to have an opinion, but I think at the end of the day, what it does is like you said, it bridges the gap and brings people together on one common issue. Even if you have completely different perspectives on the rest of life, you know, and the rest of the world. So very good. Check it out, folks. That wild country, Mark Kenyon, help Mark out because I'd love to see you like sell a, ton of these books thank you i hope i sell a few i certainly would uh, be excited about that if, if for no other reason is because i've kind of found the thing i love more than anything else this is the hardest thing i've ever done mm-hmm. but it's also the most fulfilling thing i've ever done and uh to see people positively impacted by it has been just the coolest thing ever so uh i hope yeah. i can I hope i can do it again and, and write something else that's helpful in in the, the fight for wild places and wildlife that's it's kind of what i'm trying to build my life around. And I hope that this book can be a, a starting point to doing that in a positive way. Well, I love it for anyone that is a, a public land defender, you know, it's, it's, it's like, we want to support those that are supporting this cause. And so getting, getting the book is just one step in, in supporting public lands in, in uh in a roundabout way. So it's, it's a good read. Too. It's not like you're just doing some charity. It's actually a really good book. So, well <laughs> well, thanks, done. man. Well done, I appreciate Mark. it, Brian. Thank you so much for chatting with me about it and yeah. giving it a listen and uh, and putting it out there for folks. It means the world. Yeah, you bet, folks. Get the book and uh, let us know what you think about it too. And Mark, let's get you back on again sometime soon. Don't be a stranger. I'm I'm game to do it anytime you want. And, Happy to chat, big whitetail bucks. Or... I know. You're, you're, are you going after Tran tonight? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I got the big old eight pointer that I'm hunting here in Michigan that's still evading me. Um, so, how did he get the name Tran exactly? 
So I got a buddy named Jason Tran, and he happened to – it's interesting, actually. He was at my house just before – I can't remember if it was before leaving for or getting back from the trip that we went, what, that we went on in this book. We yeah. went to Nevada together, peak bagging and backpacking and fishing and stuff. And so he came to my house, and we were leaving my house one evening. And I'm like, hey, let's go look back at this field. Uh, cause I'm just that nut of a whitetail guy. So I, I drag my buddies into scouting in the middle of the summer <laughs> and, uh, we saw this buck for the first time ever in the middle of a big soybean field. He was a, he was an eye catching, really beautiful, tight, tall eight pointer and just started watching him. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to name him after Tran since my buddy Jason Tran was with me and the first night I ever saw him. Yeah. And, and for me, I, I get, I'm fortunate that in some of these places I hunt, I can see these bucks several years in a row. And I talk about it so much on my podcast and everything that it just becomes easy to Absolutely. attach a name to them. Yep. Um, so I just kind of usually think of the first thing that comes to my mind and my buddy Tran, well, now it's the buck Tran. <laughs> well, what's so funny about that too is I've noticed a trend. If, if you're out West, you call them like brow tines or the yeah. big three. Or the distinguishing characteristic. The, yeah. If you're, if you're further East – you're just going to name the deer Joe, Bob, or Frank. Some random names, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's and that definitely buck, more common out here. That buck, Frank, you shot last year, just a – is that your best white tail to date? That is my best white tail to date, yeah. And pretty crazy that it happened in Michigan because we don't, we don't see many like that, that here. It was huge, Mark. Just Yeah, that was – You've been putting was in some time cool. for years, and that had to yeah. be good. It was, it's nice to have it all come together every once in a while, and, and that was – Definitely a memorable hunt. Uh, Holyfield, Holyfield never found him. Never found him. Never heard from anyone. Um, I found his shed in the spring of or the winter of 2018, but he never showed up that fall. Um, so my guess, if I had to place a guess on what happened, um, I wouldn't be surprised. He probably got hit maybe by a car or shot by someone during gun season in the fall of 17, but was just wounded. Um, maybe he got sick or something. And then he dropped, he made it to drop his antlers, but then probably passed away over the winter somewhere. He's probably in a swamp or a ditch somewhere and you never know. But, yeah. uh, man, he was a beautiful deer and a, and a cool animal to get to Can you pass watch. on him a couple times? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Does that once. haunt you at all? <sighs> no? You know, I don't think so. I mean, every <laughs> once in a while, yeah. but... By making that decision, I got to have a whole nother year to chase him and watch him. And I I ended up just getting so much fun and fulfillment out of getting to know these deer. I just love that process of watching them and studying them and mm -hmm. thinking, what are they doing today? And where might I be able to go to see them? And I just – I geek out over that process so much. I don't need – I don't have to kill the deer to have a cool hunt. I, I want to fill my freezer, of course. Excuse me. I always make sure I do. Um, but if I don't get the big one every year, that's okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's what happened with Holyfield. I had a hell of a journey with him. I became a better hunter mm -hmm. trying to chase him for three years. And then, you know, he disappeared last year, but a new one showed up and ended up being my biggest buck ever. And it kind of all works out. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed watching you, uh, interact with Steven Ranella where yeah. he is just in shock by your obsession. <laughs> Look, yeah, we're very can't different. Quite relate that. to your, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, OCD nature. Yeah, well, he's OCD about other things though. So yeah. it's just it's just how I apply it in a different kind of way <laughs> than him, which is perplexing. Uh, just like certain things with him are perplexing to me, right? <laughs> right. I love it. I I really oh, enjoyed that. Great. I uh, I've watched all the back forty episodes. For those who don't know, uh, thank you. You know, you you've got a series where you've purchased some land. And you have uh, tried to improve the land as a uh, kind of basically in what like an ecological experiment. Um, yeah, it's a good way to describe it. Yeah, improving. Uh, you know, you guys made the point in the series that you know there's there's private land like this across the United States, and if each landowner sort of put this ethic in place in terms of taking care of their property, where they're 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 farming it, yes, and they're putting it to uh, you know, productive use and day to day, but they're also doing other things to the property, improve it as a wildlife habitat in conjunction. And by doing these things together, you're increasing, you know, the, 
the the floral and the fauna as well as you know your your birds and 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 insects and then and mm -hmm. then also thereby increasing your population of megafauna and your deer and all of that and it's like yeah. it's a cool concept you're putting it in place and then you're also hunting it and the series is great it's on meat eater and uh it's it, that's that's been a great a great follow so check that out too thank you for those that are listening thanks yeah it's been a it's been a fun project coming off of this big public land project where I learned so much. It was it's been really enlightening to then go and look at the other side and look at private land conservation. And what I've found is that that's that's really important too. And there's right. a lot of things we can do on the private land side of things that are going to help everyone. There's a big trickle effect or uh, yep. kind of trickle down effect from public land. A spillover effect maybe is the better way to describe it. Um, something like 356 million acres or so of private land in America is owned for hunting. Crazy. So hunters have this huge impact on land that we, we can influence and positively influence the habitat on a wide scope. Um, so look at what we could do as hunters and anglers. If we can positively influence the 640 some million acres of public land out there and then positively influence the 350 million acres of private land out there, mm. look at the impact we can have if we can just keep on fighting the good fight. There's right. a lot of opportunity. Yep, absolutely. Very cool, man. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying your work. Keep it up. And, uh, Thank you. yeah, let's talk again soon. Sign me up. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.